you might one day look at a sky and think, hmm, what are these things floating about in my vision? I know I certainly have. They can be really annoying or even frightening, especially given that when you look this up on Dr. Google, it says it could be associated with a more serious eye condition. So in this video, we'll explore why we get floaters in the first place, what the risks are for having them, and what the current go-to treatments for floaters are. Hey yo, Antonio. Let me start by drawing you a diagram. When light travels into the eye, it travels through four ocular media. The cornea, the aqueous humor, the crystalline lens, and the vitreous humor. Having things float in your vision can be caused by disease in all four structures, but are rare. However, the most common form of floaters come from what are known as the vitreous floaters, formed in the vitreous humor. The vitreous humor is a jelly-like structure, packed with bundles of collagen, a protein that gives our body a firm texture. These fibers, when arranged in parallel, can allow light to travel straight through it. However, when there is a misalignment of these fibrils, the shadows they create on the retina can seem like small threads, black dots, or even cobwebs. Sometimes you might catch a glimpse of them in your peripheral vision, but when you look at them, they move away. This is because of the rotational inertia that the vitreous creates when you move your eyes back and forth. You can largely divide vitreous floaters into two categories. One, those that are endogenous to the vitreous body, known as primary vitreous floaters. And two, those that are exogenous to the vitreous body, known as the secondary vitreous floaters. The primary vitreous floaters are formed by the collagen fibrils that make up the vitreous humor. However, over time as we age, they become more numerous, thickened, and irregular. It is for this reason why the light scatters into different directions, causing shadows. I'd love to show you how this works in person by using an actual human eye, but I couldn't find anyone that would lend me their eyeball for this video, so I had to make my own. I went to the nearest supermarket and grabbed all the slime they could give me. Then I dumped the slime into a plastic container to mimic the vitreous chamber. I got rid of all the bubbles and I'm left with this setup. Over on this end, I have my light source. I'm going to shoot a beam of light into the tub of slime to mimic the light that enters our eyes. I'll also use a magnifying glass that will roughly resemble our cornea and lens combined to refract light. Over on this end, I'm going to hold a piece of paper, which will be our retina. Whatever shows up on the piece of paper is what our eyes will see. And to make things interesting, I've stuck on a piece of tape that will be our floater, and we'll see what that does to our vision. Firstly, I'm going to move the paper away from the light source, and you'll see that the shadow becomes larger, but less defined. It is for this reason why most floaters go unnoticed. Sometimes they're just too far from the retina, and will not be perceivable. With increasing age on top of the disarranged collagen fibrils, the vitreous starts to form lacunae small pockets of liquefaction that look very similar to the bubbles you see in the slime. These pockets will interfere with the photons that the eyes draw in, creating impurities that may also look like cobwebs in the sky or spot-like shadows. If you experience any of these, then please get your eyes tested. Even if it isn't anything serious, at least you'll know what it is. Occasionally, you may see floaters that look nothing like these black dots, but rather resemble something that look like glass noodles. The origin of these are still not fully understood, but they're believed to be the remnants of the hyaloid vasculature that is present during development, but later disappears. Not only are vitreous floaters more defined when they're closer to the retina, but they'll also be more noticeable when they're closer to the visual axis. And this is because the central part of the eye, packed with cones, has the highest spatial resolution, which is your ability to resolve detail and they can especially be annoying when they grab your attention in your line of sight, or even when it partially covers your vision. Just when you thought things couldn't get any weirder, we're not done with the floaters just yet. As the eye ages even further, the vitreous will liquefy, becoming smaller, and eventually collapse, causing a PVD, a posterior vitreous detachment. This is when the vitreous moves further away from the retina and detaches off of it, it is a completely normal part of life. Almost every eye on earth will come across this as long as they live long enough. 
You know how hand sanitizers are jelly-like out of the bottle, but later turn into a liquid? Well, that's sort of what's happening to the vitreous as it ages. It turns from a jelly-like structure with very little impurities into a texture that has bubbles which behaves more like a liquid. When a PVD occurs, it will most likely detach off of the optic nerve, creating what is known as a Weiss ring or a Weiss ring. I still haven't figured out how to pronounce that properly. However, the risk here is that a strongly attached vitreous may pull on the retina, creating a retinal tear or even a detachment, both of which can create floaters. Which leads on to the other type of floaters, known as the secondary vitreous floaters. Secondary vitreous floaters are made up of a combination of proteins, amyloid, and cells. Compared to primary vitreous floaters, they can be quite rare, but more serious, as they could arise from potentially blinding diseases, such as a vitreous hemorrhage or a retinal detachment. And like with any type of floater, they should be closely monitored by either your optometrist or your ophthalmologist to see if they're changing as the months go by. The last thing you want is for it to form a blinding disease, in which case it may be too late. If I do seek help, then are there any treatments that are used to get rid of floaters? For centuries, scientists and practitioners have been searching for a way to remove floaters, and to this day, there is no perfect solution. The first approach is to examine regularly. What does the floater look like now? And what does it look like 6 or 12 months down the line? If it isn't changing and it isn't harming anyone, then why touch it? Again, this can be routinely done by your optometrist or your ophthalmologist. In most cases, surgeons will prefer not to touch common floaters, as a large majority of them are harmless, and quite often, the risk of treatment far outweigh the benefits of it. But, if the floater is obstructing your vision and it's not allowing you to see properly, then that's a problem, and there are options to remove them. One option is the neodymium-doped yttrium aluminium garnet laser, also known as the ND YAG laser. Traditionally, this technology is used in other eye procedures, such as a peripheral iridotomy or a capsulotomy after cataract surgery. But they can also be used to treat floaters as well. When the collagen strands get really big and annoying, it can be zapped into smaller fragments. The idea here is that by having smaller, fragmented floaters, they will become less noticeable and less annoying. It's designed to be a safe, non-invasive way of breaking down floaters. However, the evidence does suggest that there is a high variability in the success rate, and there have been a few cases of permanent increase in intraocular pressure leading to open angle glaucoma. Yikes. This procedure should be carefully considered by your practitioner to see if the benefits outweigh the risks. So, are there any other options of removing floaters? Introducing vitrectomy. As the name suggests, it is the removal of the vitreous altogether. The success rate is reported to be very high and predictable, and sometimes the vision even improves after having it done. If it's the collagen fibers that are causing the shadows and disrupted vision, then just remove the vitreous altogether. Sounds like a no-brainer, right? Wrong. Bear in mind that every surgery comes with its own risk. So, to a surgeon, they have to make the decision whether doing the surgery will result in the benefits outweighing the risks. The most common risk following a vitrectomy are retinal tears, retinal detachments, and, mostly, cataracts. Again, if the risk of treatment far outweigh the benefits of it, then it's probably not worthwhile doing the vitrectomy. So consult your eye doctor to see what the best option would be for your unique situation. So in summary, what did we learn about floaters? They are little bits of protein, amyloid, and cells found in the vitreous jelly that create a shadow which is perceivable by the retina. Most of them are harmless, but it should still be monitored closely by your eye doctor in case it changes. There are ways of treating them, but if the risk of treatment outweigh the benefits of it, then it's not going to be worth it. If you have any questions about floaters, then make sure you leave them down in the comments below. I would love to know what questions you have. And if you haven't already, consider pressing like on this video and subscribe as that would greatly support the channel. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.